There are two suspects, but Stephen Hayes goes on trial first. He is in court today, but he looks very different from his bug shot. He's lost weight. He's in a regular striped shirt and pants. No handcuffs on him in front of the jury. I haven't heard from you in a while, and neither has Grandma. I want so bad never to hurt you again, and I feel like I am because I'm still here. Every day, I wake up wondering if today will be the day that my name is called. Her name is Jennifer Pettit, P-E-T-I-T. -E okay, she still is in the bank? Yes, she is. Okay, she's being held, her, 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 her husband, husband and family is being held? Yes. At their house? Yes, they're tied up. She said they drove her here. Okay. I'm trying to look and see where she's gone. She went outside, but I don't, oh wait, I see her walking now. She is petrified. Hi, and welcome back to Mysterious Hook, friends. Today we are looking at the disturbing case of the murders of the Pettit family. But first, if you still haven't subscribed to our channel, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the bell icon below. So without further ado, let's dive right into this mystery. Formerly known as New Cheshire Parish, Cheshire is a town in New Haven County, Connecticut, United States. With a population of over 28,000, this captivating town seamlessly blends history and modern charm. Like many Connecticut towns, Cheshire originated as a farming and light manufacturing community. However, beneath this peaceful facade, Cheshire became the unfortunate site of a chilling and infamous crime that shook the community to its core. Jennifer and William first met in 1985 when she was a new oncology nurse and he was a medical student at the University of Pittsburgh. They fell in love and got married the same year. Jennifer's passion for helping others eventually led her to become the co-director of the health center at Cheshire Academy. William, on the other hand, became an endocrinologist. Fast forward to 2007, Jennifer and William led a seemingly idyllic life. They resided in a comfortable two-story home in Cheshire, Connecticut with their two children, 17-year-old Haley and 11-year-old Michaela. Despite being a middle-class family, they enjoyed a peaceful life in the affluent suburb. Haley, the couple's eldest daughter, was a remarkable young woman who excelled both academically and athletically. She participated in varsity cross-country, basketball, and crew, demonstrating her dedication and passion for sports. Alongside her achievements, Haley also devoted her time to fundraising for multiple sclerosis research, showcasing her selflessness and desire to make a difference. I hardly knew about Haley helping with MS, and that was just because she was just so quiet about everything, and she could have bragged about everything she did. I mean, she was a straight-A student. Her academic excellence earned her a place in the high honor roll, and she had aspirations to study medicine at Dartmouth College. Michaela, the younger daughter, attended Chase Collegiate School and had her own unique interest. She found joy in gardening and delighted in preparing delicious meals for her family. Inspired by her sister, Michaela had plans to continue the fundraising efforts once Haley left for college, carrying on the family's commitment to making a positive impact. Life appeared to be going well for the Pettits, with each family member pursuing their dreams and contributing to their community. However, their world was about to be shattered by an unforeseen tragedy. Just minutes after 9 a.m., police officers responded to a distressing call. A bank manager at Bank of America had alerted them that Jennifer, after withdrawing $15,000, had claimed her family was held captive by two dangerous men who posed a threat to their lives. Following this, Jennifer then left the bank and climbed into a SUV where an unknown man awaited her. Together, they sped back to the Pettit home. Now, upon receiving the call from the bank, the police swiftly dispatched units to the Pettit's home. Acting with the utmost caution, they discreetly established a perimeter of vehicles, ensuring their presence remained concealed. Following protocol, the officers refrained from attempting any direct communication with those inside the residence. With clear instructions to exercise patience, they awaited the right moment to make their move, aware the situation demanded careful planning. However, by 10 a.m., chaos had erupted. A raging inferno had engulfed the pet at home, billowing smoke into the sky. Moments later, two figures burst out of the engulfed house escaping the scene in the Pettit family car. 
but their attempt to evade justice was short-lived, as the vigilant eyes of the police were already upon them. The chase was on, sirens blaring and adrenaline pumping, as the law enforcement closed in on the fleeing criminals. A mere block away, their reckless flight came crashing to an end, quite literally, as their car collided with a police vehicle. The two men were arrested, as Joshua Komisharvesky and Stephen Hayes. Me on the phone right now is Lieutenant Jay Markella, the public information officer for the Cheshire Police Department. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Very little detail coming out, though, about exactly what happened. Was it when police showed up that they found the house on fire and caught these suspects? Because they were caught leaving the burning house. Yeah, it, it worked out. So officers arrived on scene just as the suspects were leaving the residence. The officers couldn't help but notice the lingering scent of gasoline that clung to Hayes. During the subsequent interrogation that followed, both Joshua and Hayes confessed to unspeakable crimes that had taken place that day. Piecing together the information extracted from the two men, the police constructed a timeline of events. It all began on the evening of July 22, 2007, around 7.30 p.m., when Jennifer and her youngest daughter, Michaela, embarked on a routine grocery shopping trip to the local stop and shop. Little did they know that their every move was being closely observed by a lurking figure. That figure was Joshua. Unbeknownst to Jennifer and Michaela, Joshua had taken a keen interest in them and trailed behind, carefully shadowing their steps. As the unsuspecting mother and daughter made their way back home, he followed them and carefully noted their address. Intrigued by the sight of the Pettit's inviting residence, Joshua saw an opportunity to fulfill his criminal desires. The thought of burglarizing their seemingly perfect home enticed him, and he resolved to do just that. Meanwhile, inside the Pettit's home, life carried on as usual. Each family member went about their respective activities, completely unaware of the impending danger creeping ever closer. The peaceful atmosphere masked the impending storm that was about to ravage their lives. As the night wore on, the family went to sleep. At 3 a.m., Joshua and Hayes sent into motion the plan to burgle the Pettit family's home. The two men took advantage of an unlocked door and stealthily entered the house. Inside, William, who had dozed off while reading in the sunroom, became the first target of their assault. Joshua seized a nearby baseball bat and unleashed a vicious barrage of blows upon William, abruptly jolting him awake and plunging him into a state of shock and disbelief. Having subdued William, the assailants went down the basement, dragging him along, his body stained with blood. With calculated precision, they tightly secured his wrist and ankles with plastic zip ties, ensuring his immobilization, and then fastened him to a pipe. Perhaps to make William comfortable, they propped him up on some pillows. Meanwhile, upstairs in the bedrooms, William's wife and his daughters were oblivious to the unfolding nightmare. Haley was taken by surprise when Joshua and Hayes barged into her room. Michaela, on the other hand, was with her mother where she had fallen asleep, reading Harry Potter. The intruders wasted no time, swiftly covering Jennifer, Michaela, and Haley's faces with pillowcases, tying their bound wrists and ankles to the bedpost. The captors ensured their captives were helpless. With the family subdued, Joshua and Hayes proceeded with their mission. As the hours ticked by, the two men searched every corner of the house, hoping to stumble upon a treasure trove. However, their efforts proved fruitless, leaving them increasingly frustrated and unsatisfied. The disappointment etched on their faces was palpable, as they realized their mission was not yielding the riches they had anticipated. Joshua and Hayes, in their relentless search for valuables, soon made a discovery. The Pettits had a substantial sum of money in their checking account, estimated to be between $30,000 and $40,000. The prospect of obtaining a portion of this fortune, specifically $15,000, ignited a spark of desperation in their minds. Recognizing that they required Jennifer's cooperation, they devised a plan to coerce her into assisting them to get the money. Joshua and Hayes soon revealed their intentions to Jennifer. As the clock struck 9 a.m., Hayes and Jennifer stepped out of the house and entered the family's SUV, their destination a nearby Bank of America. Joshua remained behind to keep a watchful eye on the rest of the captive family members. 
At the bank, Hayes decided to remain in the car while he told Jennifer to enter the building to make the withdrawal. Jennifer obeyed. She made her way inside the bank and as she approached the bank teller, she calmly requested a withdrawal of $15,000. However, in a desperate bid for salvation, Jennifer seized the moment to reveal the truth. She disclosed that her family was being held captive by two dangerous men who were threatening their lives. The bank teller, taken aback by Jennifer's shocking revelation, immediately sprang into action. With a blend of concern and urgency, the teller discreetly alerted the bank manager about the situation while engaging Jennifer in conversation. It was at this point that the bank manager, realizing the gravity of the matter, immediately dialed 911 and relayed the chilling details to the dispatcher. My name is Mary Lyons. I'm the banking center manager. We have a lady who is in our bank right now who says that her husband and children are being held at their house. The people are in a car outside the bank. She is getting $15,000 to bring out to them that if the police are told, they will kill the children and the husband. Her name is Jennifer Pettit, P-E-T-I-T. -T. Okay, she still is in the bank? Yes, she is. Okay. She's being held, her, 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 her husband, husband and family is being held yes. at their house? Yes, they're tied up. She said they drove her here. Okay. I'm trying to look and see where she's gone. She went outside, but I don't, oh wait, I see her walking now. She is petrified. With the cash in hand, Jennifer hurriedly left the bank and walked to where Hayes was waiting for her in the vehicle. Together, they made their way out of the area. At some point, Hayes acquired gasoline from a gas station using two containers he got from the Pettit residence. Amid these events, the situation inside the Pettit home took a distressing turn. During Hayes and Jennifer's absence at the bank, Joshua committed an unspeakable act. He subjected Michaela to a horrifying abuse that defied all decency. Shockingly, he documented the whole thing on his cell phone. And so when Hayes and Jennifer returned from the bank, Joshua confessed his heinous act against Michaela to Hayes. As a sick form of retribution for what had been done to Michaela, Joshua urged Hayes to take advantage of Jennifer. This horrifying request aimed to inflict further suffering and humiliation upon the Pettits. As the distressing events unfolded, William Bound and Helpless in the Basement could hear his wife being violated. Filled with anguish and desperation, he summoned all his strength and shouted. His voice echoed through the house, pleading for the torment to cease. In a flurry of chaotic events, multiple incidents unfolded while the police maintained their position outside the Pettit's home. William managed to cut himself loose and make a daring escape through the basement window. Meanwhile, as Hayes continued his despicable acts upon Jennifer, Joshua ventured into the basement to check on William, only to discover his absence. In a chilling turn, Hayes, driven by panic, strangled Jennifer to silence her cries. With their deeds complete, Hayes and Joshua took things a step further. They poured gasoline on Jennifer's lifeless body and in parts of the house. Shockingly, they extended their cruelty to the innocent Michaela and Haley, who remained bound and helpless with pillowcases covering their faces. The men doused them with gasoline. Following this, one of the men lit a match, igniting a fire they made their way out of the house. Meanwhile, William, after escaping from the house, went to seek help from a neighbor. What's your emergency? Are you police? Yes. I got Bill Pettit here who's hurt, my neighbor. Okay. All right, get yes, in the house. You two, get in the house. Get in the house. I need a one-on-one -on -one here now. Uh, now. The neighbor was shocked by William's battered appearance and his urgent plea. The girls are in the house. Despite the swift response from firefighters, it was too late. The house had been badly affected by the fire. Haley and Michaela had succumbed to the deadly smoke before any rescue could reach them. So there were four people home and we had... Again, facts like that I can't comment okay. All I can tell you right now is that we do have three confirmed fatalities. Two females who are still checking. And the survivor. It was discovered that Haley had managed to break free from her restraints and attempted to flee, only to die from the smoke 
at the top of the staircase. The severe burns on her feet revealed how close she came to escaping the inferno. Tragically, Michaela's lifeless body was discovered still bound to the bed. The home invasion had lasted seven hours, and William, the only survivor, was left to bear the weight of the grief and loss that shattered his once vibrant family. Now, despite both Joshua's and Hayes' confessions, each man pointed fingers at the other, trying to shift the blame and paint themselves as mere pawns in a diabolical scheme. July 23rd, 2007. Statement is taking place at the Cheshire Police Department headquarters. Joshua, comma, suggest. Do you know why you're here? For a uh, home invasion gone terribly wrong. Okay. And you went to stop and shop in Cheshire? I was waiting for a contractor uh, to make payment. While waiting, I saw a mother and a daughter for whatever reason, I chose to follow the mom and the daughter um, to their house and saw that they lived in a very nice house. Thought it would be nice to be there someday. And Mr. Hayes and I made our way over to the house and donned face masks and put on rubber gloves. And we noticed that the father was sleeping downstairs. I could see Mr. Hayes in the window uh, motioning to, to strike him and, and get it over with. And, uh, I hit him in the head with a baseball bat and he let out this unworthy scream and just kept hitting him until he finally packed up into the corner of the couch. And, uh, Mr. Hayes and I uh, proceeded up the stairway. So he's put his hand over the mom's mouth and shook her uh, gently awake. I followed suit with the youngest uh, daughters. I tied her feet and Mr. Hayes tied her hands. and put um, pillowcases over the occupants' heads. Um, yeah. yeah, so that they couldn't see us. I then went into KK's room and sat down and we were talking about school and summer plans and I cut her a glass of water. KK, obviously she told you her nickname or whatever is KK or you made that up? No, that's the name that both her sister and her mother uh, referred to her as. I checked on dad and then went into KK's room and you know, one thing led to another, and uh, I ended up performing oral sex on KK. You performed oral sex on KK? On KK. Her hands were tied, but her feet weren't. Did you take pictures of her? Uh, I did, yes. I had let her get uh, dressed again, but before she did that, she uh, asked if she could take a shower. Now, you said you let her get dressed again. How, how is it she came upon being undressed? Because you originally said she was dressed. I had uh, I used a pair of scissors and had cut her, her shirt off and her skirt off. Steve had come back to the house and uh, he had the money in his hands. He uh, says, uh, very matter of factly, okay, you're, you're ready. We got we to gotta kill them and burn the house down. I'm like, I'm not killing anyone. There's no way. Well, then, you know, I'll kill the two daughters and you can kill the mom. I was like, I'm not killing anyone. No one's dying by my hand today. And finally, he was like, I'll, I'll take care of all three of them. I hear this noise down in the basement. Which is where the dad was. Which is right where the dad was. I jumped up, uh, screaming to Steve that, father just took off. I could see behind Steve that uh, the mother was uh, laying lifelessly on the floor and her pants were down around her ankles. He then went up the stairs uh, with two bottles. And I was like, you can't
can't seriously be, be contemplating burning these, these two girls alive. I went to KK's room. Um, there was no gasoline in there. She was still in her bed. And I closed the door. And then I went down to the oldest daughter's room. I closed that door and I went downstairs. Why did you close, close the doors? So you, I don't, I don't, you I knew don't they were tied, but you closed the doors. I didn't even think about untying them. Like, I, it, it, for, for whatever stupid reason, like, it just didn't cross my mind. Until he comes racing back down the stairs and he throws one of the empty bottles into the kitchen. Empty bottles of of, of gas of gasoline. So he went back up with another with bottle another of gas. Another bottle of gas. He's stumbling with this oversized pack of matches, and I can still see this person in the, in the grass watching us. Okay. And the entire kitchen just it erupts. Goes. Yeah, and it's like a sea of flame. I had already had my back turned, and I'm running for the door. Oh, you know, I, I got myself in this horrible position, but, you know, they did, they, they did what they were supposed to do. There, there's no reason for them to die. As investigators delved into the backgrounds of the perpetrators, a dark and troubled path emerged. The life of Hayes in particular was marked by a long list of criminal activities. His journey into delinquency began during his adolescence, when he started experimenting with vices like drinking and smoking. At the tender age of 16, he faced his first arrest, and from there, his encounters with the law became alarmingly frequent. By the time the Cheshire murders occurred, Hayes, who was 44 years old, had been in and out of jail or prison on 26 occasions. While many of his offenses seem minor, they painted a picture of a man who thrived on illicit activities. He's got all these burglaries, most involve car burglaries, and this state burglary includes the break-in of a car. And they were all daytime. He'd sit and watch. People would park their cars. They'd go walking on a trail, break into their car and take a laptop or a radio or a phone. So you were not dealing with someone who had the kind of classic history of violence and all of a sudden stepped into the big time in terms of the next level of violence. You just didn't have it. There's no reason that anyone would ever look at that history and think, well, this guy's going to do something really bad one day. When he wasn't engaged in theft or serving time for his crimes, he found employment in various restaurants. Just two years before the Cheshire murders, Hayes found himself behind bars once again, this time for smashing a car window with a rock and stealing a woman's purse. The first time that I found out about my dad, I was probably about five years old. He would like take me to the movies and he really tried to be that father figure to me, but for whatever reason, he just couldn't stay out of trouble. And so when he went back to jail, like he would write to me and I would write back and that was our way of communicating. Dear Alicia, hello honey and how are you doing? I haven't heard from you in a while and neither has grandma. I want so bad never to hurt you again. And I feel like I am because I'm still here. Every day, I wake up wondering if today will be the day that my name is called. He was eventually paroled in 2006 and sent to Silliman Halfway House, where his path intertwined with that of Joshua, setting the stage for the fateful events that would forever haunt the town of Cheshire. So you see the name spelled out, the Komisarzewski name, and you sit there and you hold your head in your hands and you can't believe it and you want to cry. This young man's a monster, and that is not the way that we, as members of this family, behave. Following this, investigators focused on Joshua's background. Joshua's early life began with his adoption at birth by Benedict Karmaszewski, an electrician, and his mother, Jude Karmaszewski, a school librarian. However, even from a young age, there were signs of inner turmoil. Joshua was diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, a type of behavior disorder in a child marked by defiance and disobedience to authority figures. This condition strained his relationships and led to challenges in school. In an effort to provide him with a more suitable environment, his mother made the difficult decision to homeschool him, occasionally enrolling him in a Christian academy. 
But as Joshua approached his teenage years, a darkness seemed to consume him. His mother would later claim that he fell under the influence of a satanic cult, although it's unclear whether this was the truth or simply a desperate attempt to explain his troubling behavior. Regardless, at the age of 14, Joshua's life took a sharp turn. He began breaking into homes in Cheshire, targeting an astonishing average of eight houses per week. The troubles in Joshua's life continued to escalate. In the early 1990s, he faced accusations of abusing his own sister. The weight of the evidence was enough to secure a conviction. Even during the penalty phase of his trial, Joshua's father admitted that the accusations were likely true. Then in 2002, he faced another round of legal trouble, this time for 18 home invasions. During this period, Joshua didn't shy away from sharing the intricate details of each burglary with his defense attorney at the time. He revealed how he would enter people's homes and listen to the sleeping occupants breathe, relishing in the act of invading their private spaces and violating their sense of security. Burglary, 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 and burglary. Genius that he is, and he is a genius in, in some respects, with a photographic memory and uh, uh, attention to detail that uh, no normal mind could possibly uh, retain. He told them every burglary he did. He knew every item he took, passports, what dumpsters he threw it in. Joshua could get into the third floor, steal things, know which denominations of bills he took a, a year later, two years later, tell you where each wallet was, what kind of pants they were taken from, where the pants were on the floor, on the bedpost, in the closet, stay there for hours, not get caught. Joshua used a relatively sophisticated equipment for a burglar, night vision goggles, latex gloves. After he'd rob the house, he would stay there on occasion and listen to the people breathing. He'd go from room to room listening to the occupants breathing for no apparent purpose. Um, that was the frightening part of it. He robbed state troopers' houses, which takes some guts. Joshua was eventually convicted of 12 counts of burglary in December 2002. The court handed down a sentence of nine years in prison, coupled with six years of special parole. During his sentencing, Judge James Bentevenga aptly described Joshua as a calculated, cold-blooded predator. After serving his time, Joshua was released on parole in April 2007, leading him to cross paths with Hayes at the Silliman Halfway House setting in motion the tragic events that would forever scar the town of Cheshire. Now after the harrowing details of the Pettit family murders emerged, questions began to swirl around William's action during the horrific ordeal. Curiosity lingered as to why he hadn't managed to free himself sooner. Why had it taken over six hours for him to break free from his restraints? And why, instead of heading upstairs to the second floor, did he choose to flee out of the house? In a society captivated by tales of heroic men saving the day, the image of a vulnerable and incapacitated father struck a nerve, challenging conventional notions of strength and courage. Well, as the legal proceedings unfolded, both Joshua and Hayes found themselves facing a daunting array of charges. A total of 17 counts, ranging from assault to murder to kidnapping, were brought against them. However, when the time came from the respective trials, a decision was made to try them separately. There are two suspects, but Stephen Hayes goes on trial first. He is in court today, but he looks very different from his mugshot. He's lost weight. He's in a regular striped shirt and pants. No handcuffs on him in front of the jury. And it is because this case has gotten so much publicity that picking an impartial jury could be difficult. Hayes, desperate to avoid the impending trial, made a bold move by attempting to negotiate a plea bargain that would secure him a life sentence. However, the prosecutors determined to seek the ultimate form of punishment, decided to proceed with the trial and pursue the death penalty. A high-stakes battle was set to unfold in the courtroom, where the fate of Hayes would be determined. In a dramatic turn of events, before the trial commenced, Hayes' despair reached a breaking point. He resorted to a drastic measure overdosing on prescription medication in his cell. His life hung in the balance 
as he was swiftly rushed to a hospital. He was eventually stabilized. Nine or so doses of Thorazine and Clonopin. And you, you might question how this could happen. About a year before this, Stephen Hayes had made a suicide attempt. And one of the things they found in his cell was a suicide note. I quote, I am sorry. All I want to do is die. It is the only way to end the pain I go through every day, 24-7, and more important, the pain that trial will bring to others. Time to go to the last undiscovered country. Although I am not the monster that Josh is, I am one nevertheless. A coward, because I could not do what was right. Looking back on my life, I was nothing but a self-centered asshole who cared only of himself. But the ironic facet to this is I have always had the ability to change. But cowards don't change. They become me. On September 13, 2010, Hayes' trial commenced. The jury, consisting of seven women and five men, took their seats, knowing they held the weighty responsibility of determining the fate of a man who had committed unspeakable acts. Soon, the battle of narratives unfolded. Hayes' defense attorneys argued that Joshua, the co-conspirator, was the true mastermind behind the horrific home invasion, asserting his escalating violence had shaped the course of events. Prosecutors, on the other hand, maintained that both Hayes and Joshua shared culpability for the crimes that had shattered the Pettit family's lives. On October 5, 2010, as the trial drew to a close, the jurors were treated to deliberate. After approximately five hours of intense discussion, they reached a guilty verdict. The sensing phase of the trial commenced on October 18, 2010, with the jury trying to determine whether Hayes should face the ultimate punishment of death or spend the rest of his days locked away in a prison cell. Deliberations commenced on November 5, 2010. The first day of deliberations concluded with the jury in a deadlock. On the following day, November 6, 2010, the jurors reconvened. Defense attorney Thomas Ullman pleaded for leniency, painting a picture of a tormented soul haunted by his own actions, arguing that a lifetime of isolation in prison would be the harshest punishment Hayes could endure. Ultimately, Hayes was sentenced to death on six capital charges, ensuring the gravity of his crimes would not go unanswered. Additionally, he received 106 years in prison on non-capital charges, further cementing his severity of his transgressions. Although an execution date of May 27, 2011 was set, the judge acknowledged the potential for lengthy appeals, which could postpone Hayes' execution for an indefinite period. Thus, the date served as a formality, signifying the complex nature of the legal process. Thief in the night, I've come to steal not jewels and money, but your personal safety, privacy, and security. I violate your inner asylum of intimacy. I piss on your optical illusion of peace and innocence. I feast on your animosity. The Pettit family passed through their fear into the calm waters of abject terror like mesmerized rabbits cornered by a spring predator. To see that fear, that emotional pain I feel every day manifested on another's face validates that this pain in me is real. The shock waves of my self's hopelessness reverberated its bitterness through my rock soul, the realization that I crossed life's bridge of depravity. The awakening of my shadow, repressed within, reaching its zenith that morning with rapturous control of Michaela. Her age was insignificant. Just like Hayes, Joshua's attorneys proposed a guilty plea in exchange for a life sentence. However, prosecutors opted for a trial with the intention of seeking the death penalty. Joshua's trial commenced on September 19, 2011. His defense team placed the blame on Hayes portraying Joshua as a vulnerable and easily influenced individual who did not have murderous intentions. 
On October 13, 2011, Joshua was found guilty. The jury recommended the death penalty on December 9, 2011. During the sentencing hearing, Joshua delivered a statement expressing his remorse and acknowledged the pain he had caused. He spoke of the everlasting burden he would carry, saying he would never find inner peace and his life would be a continuous reminder of the hurt he inflicted. While admitting his involvement in the crime, he maintained that he did not intend to take anyone's life. William, in his victim impact statement, likened the crime to his personal holocaust, describing the lasting effects it had on his ability to sleep and trust. The judge assigned July 20, 2012 as the execution date for Joshua, acknowledging that the appeals process could potentially delay the execution indefinitely. Now, during the trials of both Joshua and Hayes, the jury members were confronted with the harrowing evidence that left a lasting impact on their well-being. Autopsy photos depicting the victim's lifeless bodies and disturbing images captured by Joshua on his cell phone as he assaulted Michaela were presented in court. The graphic nature of the evidence and the deeply distressing witness testimonies took a toll on the jurors, causing severe psychological and emotional trauma. In 2015, Connecticut abolished the death penalty, resulting in a change in Joshua and Hayes' sentences. Both of them were sentenced to life imprisonment, effectively removing the possibility of the release from prison. William's heart sank as he received the news of the Connecticut Supreme Court's decision to abolish the death penalty. He believed that the court had exceeded its authority and urged them to consider the emotional impact that death penalty cases have on victims and their families. He emphasized the need for justice and closure, which he felt only the death penalty could provide. However, his pleas were disregarded, leaving him with a profound sense of loss and questioning whether true justice had been served. In the aftermath of the tragedy, William found the strength to rebuild his life. Determined to keep the memory of his loved ones alive, he established a foundation in their honor. It is here, and as many of you recall, you know, it wasn't that long ago that, you know, you suffered a tragedy losing your wife and your two daughters in a home invasion. Um, talk a little bit, if you will, Dr. Pettit, about the mission, about the mission of the Pettit Family Foundation. It's essentially to help out people with uh, chronic illnesses, which was a, a, a nod to Haley, who was accepted at Dartmouth and wanted to major in uh, biology and consider medicine or other careers and to help people affected by uh, violence in their life, which there's obviously uh, far too much of is evidenced by the shootings in Oakland and the shootings in Pittsburgh. It was through this organization that he crossed paths with Christine Pauleve, who would become his second wife. Together they formed a bond and their love grew. In time, they welcomed a son into the world, whom they named William Pettit III. Despite moving forward, William held a heartfelt wish that people would remember his lost family. He wanted their memories to live on, their lives cherished, and their stories shared. As we conclude the devastating account of the Pettit family murders, we are left with a profound sense of loss and a myriad of emotions. The unimaginable horrors that they endured serve as a stark reminder of the fragility of life and the depths of human cruelty. But as we reflect on this heartbreaking tale, some questions linger. How do we prevent such tragedies from occurring in the first place? What steps can we take as a society to address the underlying issues that fuel such acts of violence and destruction? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. Do not forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Stay safe, and thanks for watching.